to confess something, okay? I'm a Detroit Pistons fan. I'm a, I uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you're a Detroit Pistons fan, then you, you probably know if you've been watching the Last Dance documentary that a lot of people are not happy with the Detroit Pistons. Yes, I know that. <laughs> I was sure about that, but I couldn't imagine it's unbelievable, you know, the level of the hate. There's so much hate. Uh, Michael Jordan uh, seems to be too much angry, irritated about, about Pistons. And uh, it's, it's been 30 years, okay? 30 years from, uh, from that point. It's been 30 years, but, you know, um, uh, back in those days, uh, the pain, you know, the pain of of playing the Pistons and knowing that, you know, you were going to, uh, you're going to be involved with a physical game that wasn't necessarily basketball sometimes. Sometimes it was just, you know, we're, we're fighting on the court. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, the, the scars from those memories last a long time. And I think, um, you know, I think it's great that Michael's having a chance to share some of those pains and, and get some of that off of his chest. Uh, but I think it's clearly given a, 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 a people a chance to see just how upset he was during that time. Mm -hmm. During this period, that period, Michael Jordan was uh, so upset. He was uh, uh, so angry with uh, Detroit Pistons, like he showed in the uh, documentary. Uh, he said, he, I, I hate Pistons, okay? Uh, Horace Grant said the same thing. Oh, these damn Pistons. Uh, everyone told these damn Pistons. You said about the basketball game that uh, they used to perform. Of course, uh, sometimes it was uh, like a wrestling, okay? It was not, not uh, basketball. But uh, it was a way of winning. And Michael Jordan used to say that it's all about winning. Well, you know, you, you're right. It is. It, 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 it was the style that the Pistons um, identified that would give them great success. They knew that you know, against the Bulls specifically, uh, it was a team early on that um, um, was a little inexperienced in playoff basketball. Uh, they, they weren't a very mentally, uh, physically strong uh, team early on in Michael's beginning years. Scotty was a rookie. Horace was, you know, those guys were young players. And, th and they were searching for something that they could take advantage of, like all teams do. You're trying to figure out how to win. You got to find a team's weakness, and then you have to try to expose that weakness. And and the Pistons did that. So in reality, it was it was fair play by the Pistons to attack their their um, their weakness, uh, which was their their aggressiveness and their mental strength. Um, but I think I think probably what really cemented the um, the relationship between Michael and, and Isaiah and also the Pistons was the fact that, and you saw it on the Last Dance documentary, when, when Michael and the Bulls lost to the Pistons, they went over, they shook hands, they congratulated them. Um, uh, Michael is from that North Carolina, you know, proper sportsmanship school of basketball. Mm -hmm. And so the proper thing to do, even in defeat, they is can. to congratulate your victory. Yes. And, and so <clears throat> I think the, the problem that Michael had uh, that really burned him and stuck with him was the way when they won, the Pistons didn't come to them and say congratulations and, you know, you guys fought and, and finally beat us. You know, that, that would have been the mature sportsman-like thing for Isaiah Lane Beer, the veteran players of the league, to do, to still a pretty young Michael Jordan. And so when, when, when Isaiah and those guys walked past him, uh, didn't even acknowledge him, didn't give him a wave and say, hey, great game, great series, just we're going to ignore you. Um, I, I think that, you know, that dug some deep, deep layers of resentment that, you know, that, that Michael has carried for a long time. And obviously from the documentary, you can tell that he still <laughs> feels it. Yeah, about the... Uh... Which was, uh, you know, uh, what was uh, difficult, uh, the scars of prisons or to make, uh, uh, you know, to, to train with uh, Michael Jordan because we saw, you know, some uh, scenes. Uh, he seems to, to make bullying to his teammates, okay? He's, uh, he has a lot of demands from uh, his teammates because uh, it was all about winning, of course, but uh, like he was bullying his teammates in order to push themselves and to be better. 
Well, you know, when, when, when I was there <clears throat> in 87, 88, um, uh, and then 89, uh, I left and went to the Orlando Magic, Michael was just really becoming um, a vocal leader. Uh, up until then, he was, you know, you know, focused on developing his game. Uh, he was becoming a superstar even at that point but he wasn't accepting the challenge of having to be the vocal team leader. Mm -hmm. And, and I think when I left to Orlando uh, that next year, they won the championship. And I, and I think during that period and the next six championships or five championships, Michael started to exercise his voice as a leader mm -hmm. and, and not only as you know, a leader, but a very demanding leader that, uh, that it would take to be able to win six NBA championships. That's, uh, that's not easy to do. A lot of good players in the NBA. And so to be able to reach that level of success, it demanded that he, you know, get on guys when they weren't working hard in practice, or he jumped on guys when they, they weren't executing the plays exactly to the T. And, and I think, you know, the players responded, obviously, uh, because they had a talented group of guys. Uh, but but I think now when you look at the documentary and you see how aggressive he was, you know, we're seeing a side of Michael that most people never had a chance to see. And uh, I have to make another confession, okay? Uh, watching the two first uh, episodes of the uh, documentary, I didn't like the fact that uh, everyone was pointing their finger to Jerry Krause, okay? Uh, it seems that was uh, the bad guy, uh, that uh, he didn't do anything uh, nice, anything good. What's your opinion about Jerry Krause? Well, Jerry Krause was the one that brought me to Chicago, you know, midway through uh, that 87 season. I was in uh, Seattle playing with the Supersonics and Sadell three was on the Bulls and Sadell ran into some, some, um, some disciplinary issues uh, in Chicago and, and I, frankly, was looking to get out of Seattle, and I went to uh, Chicago and became a starter uh, in the backcourt with Michael, and, and the team took about a 15-game jump that season. We got into the 50s, and that was kind of the beginning of, you know, turning... The evolution. <laughs> yes, that was, that was evolution, exactly. And so um, Jerry Krause was a big part of, of how I got to Chicago, so I've always respected him as a general manager, but... You know, clearly in the documentary, you can see how, even though he brought Phil Jackson in, he started he he began to develop some animosity with Phil, uh, because his his role in putting it all together was not as shiny and glittery as <laughs> Phil's and the players, <laughs> and and you know Jerry wasn't happy sitting in the back, and and getting the credit. He wanted to be out front and get mm. the credit. He won and the general credit. managers rarely, you know, they rarely get the credit. The, the players and the coaches, players first, always. And, and then the, maybe the coaches, and then maybe the general manager will get some credit. And, and, and I think because of that, Jerry really just really went to a level of animosity that I think um, began to be a problem. And I'm sure in these next episodes, we're going to see how big of a problem that was because Michael eventually left. Uh, the Bulls team was was destroyed, uh, and that that was a team that was still pretty much in its prime. I mean, I think that team could have still probably won two more championships. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have another connection with uh, with MJ because he hired you as a coach in uh, Charlotte Bobcats in 2007. Uh, but it's all about winning, and uh, after one year, uh, you, you you've been fired from uh, Charlotte Bobcats, but. Uh, uh, you know, I read an interview you, you gave to Sam Smith, and uh, you said uh, great things about MJ, about what he did in uh, Charlotte Bobcats. Uh, you are friends with uh, MJ. Absolutely. Um, um, you know, if you look back at the history with Michael, uh, it goes all the way back to uh, 1981, the McDonald's All-American team, where we met in Wichita, Kansas. And we developed a friendship there and, and, and then had a close friendship when I played in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, and then had a close friendship when, uh, when he hired me with the Bobcats. You know, I think, I think uh, you know, from a media standpoint, uh, that, that was never correctly printed. And, and, and I think that caused a little bit of a problem. You know, I, a, a journalist asked me, 
um, uh, if I thought Michael put the same energy into being an owner that he put in as a player. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, you know, I said, Hey, you know, it, it, first of all, it'd be hard to put the same energy in as an owner that you put in as a player, because that's where his, his natural passion was as, as a player. I think as an owner, it's a different, it's a different game. You know, he, he may never, uh, as an owner be as passionate, uh, about ownership as he was about, you know, his craft as a player. And then when it was, when it was published, it came out as Sam Vincent says, Michael is not as passionate as an owner as he was as a player. And that was something I always felt bad about, but, you know, Michael and I communicated, you know, a lot of times, you know, after that and, and still occasionally we'll, we'll trade emails and a phone conversation. So, is there something that you will never forget with, uh, by the time you used to play again with, uh, with MJ? Man, there's a lot of things I'll never forget. Um, you know, the, even though it was a couple of years, the opportunity to practice every day with him was incredible because he was just a hardworking, um, uh, explosive, you know, every single day committed kind of guy. So, you know, our practices yeah. were, were, were fantastic. Our, our games, obviously, I saw him do so many incredible things. But, you know, there, there, there was one specific game in Detroit uh, in the yeah. Eastern yeah. Conference semifinals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was, I think it might have been game two Eastern Conference semifinals. And Doug was really on us in the locker room prior to the game. And, and we really wanted to go out and get a win in that game. Uh, and, and so we were all excited and all, you know, really pumped up and we come out and in the first half of that game, uh, I remember, you know, just really being on a tear. I think I had maybe 27, 28 points in the first half. Mm -hmm. Michael had maybe like eight or nine points. And so, uh, you know, at halftime, I remember Michael on our way back out to the court saying, Hey, Sam, man, you had a great first half. <laughs> <Shots probably well. laughs> but make sure you do a lot more passing in the second half. <laughs> and Michael ended up scoring, I don't know, he must have came out from, from nine points in the first half and scored another 40. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. It was uh, an incredible game. We won that game in Detroit. Uh, we went back to uh, Chicago and eventually lost that series. Uh, but it was the beginning. You know, it was the beginning of their uh, ability to uh, get past the Pistons. Who is the, who's the greatest player <laughs> in the history? <laughs> who's the GOAT? Man, who's the GOAT? You know, that's, that's a, the facilities, that's a tough question. You know, I, you know, it, you know, for guys who grew up in this Michael Jordan era, it's easy to say Michael. Some of the younger kids now say LeBron because they didn't grow up in the Michael era. So even though they, they've seen some of his highlights, they didn't see him play. But then I was on a conversation with a gentleman a few days ago who grew up in the Kareem and Will Chamberlain era. And so I, I think the GOAT is relevant to the era. Yeah. You know, there, there, there are some who believe it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar because he's the all-time leading scorer, most years played, most games played. How, how can it not be Kareem? Uh, but, but for me, and having played with Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay with Michael because I had a chance to, to be close to watching him, playing with him, and seeing him do things that I haven't seen anybody else do. Oh, 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 oh.